All right, we're rolling. Now, before we move on, is your beard a quarantine beard? Is this a pandemic beard or <laughs> is this a post-production beard? No, I, I have the beard here. Every once in a while, I, I, uh, I get rid of it to see what's under the hood. But um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's usually my, my, uh, my mainstay. When was the last time you were entirely clean shaven? uh i'd say back around actually no that's not true it's actually when i first got to um uh when i got to london i was clean shaven for like a short bit but that was like due to a mishap more than anything so how did that feel for you being clean shaven did you feel like yourself because i'm i might be four months in on my beard i mean this has been a lot but i finally feel like a man you know (laughs) <laughs> you know I, I you know my son always feels like i look really vulnerable um but i you know, I, I have a good chin and a little cleft there's like stuff to look at there that that but i just i don't know i actually it came out of just not wanting to uh have the daily regime it just gets fatiguing and tiring and i can't do it and then it just starts to come back and then i just let it go so i've never let it like get too crazy like david letterman or jim carrey beard i've never done that I mean, like you're like kind weird. of you're kind of owning like the grizzled director veteran look. Well, you know, it'd be accurate. I'm a grizzled veteran director, so it like suits me. Well, hey, speaking of which, I um I saw parts. I didn't see the entire thing, but I saw parts of is it Rorschach? Rorschach, yeah, Rorschach. And so this, when we were on the phone, this was the movie that you went out in Boston and hustled and got funding, correct? I actually was here. I you know, but I was I was a student at the time um a lot of things happened in my life all at once where like the the early 90s recession happened my parents were like flat broke in from real estate and being overextended in the 80s and like all that glory like came to an end and the dance they were doing collapsed so like in a matter of like and then what you know is is I don't know if it's a Boston thing I don't know if it's a Greek thing but like nobody told me what was going on so like all of a sudden I get a call that was like hey we're getting divorced hey we lost the house hey we're broke hey we can't pay for school anymore and the way financial aid worked at the time was it it, it, you know required past tax returns so there wasn't something for the immediate like your whole life just fell apart how do you stay in school so I didn't it was right around the time of like the final school senior year school project and I didn't get that project which you know, was the thing that I felt that I had like worked hard to get and for whatever reason it didn't work out. So I took the idea I had for that short, which was going to be like an eight minute piece and then expanded it out, which was, you know, a story that came, I was a psych minor, a linguistics minor and a, and a Judaic studies minor, even though I'm not Jewish. Um, but I was fascinated by the Holocaust. And then I just kept taking more courses relating to it because it was a fascinating subject that was in my general education portion of USC. And that's what brought me out here was SC. So I was in this limbo. And so before everything ran out, I was paid through the semester. So my my directing teacher let me, while I was in his class, kind of invent a project and gave me all the necessary paperwork. So I could, you know, I was a student, I could solicit like tax deductible donations, I could go get favors, but I had to like work quickly and get out of kind of the school because I wasn't going to be able to be there. So actually, I didn't actually finish USC. I left with like mid my last semester and it was summer of 92, you know, it was approaching summer of 92 and the LA riots happened. Um, You know, the Northridge earthquake was to come in a couple of years. There was like, it was like a crazy time. Like it was right, you know, OJ trial was was, um, uh, like a year off. Like it was that time in LA when like all that stuff was was sort of swirling in the nineties, the Unabomber, like I'd say from like 92 to 95 was like, you know, very charged year in the news. So I like hustled up about $18,000. So, um, and there was no Kickstarter back then. There was no internet back then. So I put that together. I made this short film. I made it kind of the way I wanted to make it. it played out like a, like a Twilight Zone episode and it um, uh, jump-started my career, really. It, like it was something that I had in hand that I could hustle around town. I had a screening for it. I got an agent off it. And, you know, shortly after that, 
in a weird course of events, it got in the it got in two people's hands that really changed my career, which was um, Diane Keaton got a copy of the tape, and this is a VHS tape that was like I'd get in my car or my bike and like drive them around town, and she brought me on to be a visual consultant for her on a film she was directing. And then interestingly, around the same time, Steven Seagal, uh, who was like right on cresting his apex of his career and now on the slide down, like saw it and brought me in and brought me under his deal, Warner Brothers, uh, to direct a movie for him uh, that never ended up happening. So like at 23, I had a three picture deal at Warner Brothers. It was all sort of happening as I imagined it to happen. And um, it wasn't long before I realized that the movie industry is like really protracted it it, it it was always sort of a very broken system of of fits and starts and so it just wasn't the kind of thing that was making sense to me and so I was like I had this three picture deal but I was still temping in a law firm downtown sorting mail and none of it was really making sense so I uh, went back to the people at Universal that gave me the editing room for Rorschach and asked you know if I could start shadowing television um, commercials came looking for me, propaganda, which is where Fincher and Michael Bay came out of, was, was it, were interested in representing me. Uh, TV interested me because A, I wasn't allowed to watch television growing up. And I was, I thought that medium was closer to film than maybe commercials were. And that was right before all those directors broke out of propaganda. So, um, so I got into television really early, shadowed got an episode, I started doing reenactments for America's Most Wanted. And then that eventually led to, you know, what was called syndicated television. So before there was streaming and before every network owned a studio, there was all these independent companies that made television and sold them to markets. So I was doing shows like Soldier of Fortune and The Invisible Man and VIP with Pamela Anderson. And so things like that were like my early 90s work. And then um, uh, is how it all kind of got got on a roll in a quick version seems like quite the whirlwind of events man <laughs> it seems like you, you came here and things just started happening yeah school was a great way to like uh, we, we were talking about before we, we we went online here you and i was just like it's it's a tough city and i'm glad that i had school as an intro like i didn't have any family in the industry i didn't know anybody out here you know it was like you know, this was not an industry that my family understood or understood what I wanted to do when I wanted to become a director. Um, that was, you know, that was something that was really like totally by accident. You know, I saw a you know, camcorder um, at 14, you know, 1984. Um, it blew my mind. You know, I begged my parents, my parents were starting to do well in the eighties before everything crashed. And so begged them for a camcorder, begged them for a VCR, you know, I just couldn't believe that like you could get movies and watch them at home. Like all that stuff was like blowing my mind. And then cable, uh, you know, would come from town to town. So it was, you, you were hearing about cable and, and the mythical HBO. By the way, I just read the book Tinderbox, which I recommend, which is all about the history of HBO. I heard it's awesome. Start. Yeah, it's, it's a deep dive, but you really get to the origins. But I was one of those people like, chasing the trucks, trying to find out when it was going to come to my town, I mean, come to my street. And I got involved in public access when I was in high school in Needham because that it, cable had already come to Needham and they had a public access station. And so then when it came to Wellesley, which is where I lived, you know, my parents, I grew up in Waltham until I was five. My parents moved to like the very edge of Wellesley to like the cheapest house at the very board. I was like right at the border. I was like the last house that was like- Yeah, the schools, yeah. Yeah, I was right by like the walk, um, which I don't even know is still there, but I was like way over by Route 9, down by Fifth School. And then, um, you know, it was a, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was something that, you know, but after the camcorder, I had a subscription to Rolling Stone magazine and they had an article about film school. And that's how I learned that like, you could go to film for this. And it was just like a, a hobby I had. And I did public access, which was out of Babson College. And all that was like really formidable. So in a very academic town, in a very athletic town, in an extremely white town, I had this um, real like push towards the arts and kind of found my calling that I was like better at this than being a student or being an athlete and started to, and you know, 
I was Greek and I was one of the only Greek families. So I was darker complexion and, you know, didn't look too different than this. And so that I, so I felt out of place in a lot of the, the clicks that were happening back then. And it was, you know, it was the time when bullying was alive and well, and like, you know, the, the culture of things was so different back then. And so, you know, I was a really shy kid and didn't have a lot of confidence, but I, when I got behind a camera and I could direct, I had a real sense of what was possible and my imagination ran free. And thankfully I had a creative writing teacher that really believed in me and my parents thankfully didn't hold me back from pursuing this. I think mostly because they didn't understand it and it was so out there that they like let me run with it. And I minored in psych because that was what I thought I would have gone into had I not gone into film. Um, thanks. Just before we move on, can, for anyone tuning in, can you just give a quick synopsis of who you are and what you do? So this makes sense to everybody. Yeah. I'm Greg Utanis. I'm a director. I'm a television director. Um, and I live in California. I've got three kids. I, you know, I've been doing this for about 30 years and, you know, it's a craft that I've come to love. I think I, I think as I've, as I've gone on, you know, I found who I am that work is an extension of who I am, you know, as you evolve, you know, from your ambitious twenties into your like roaring thirties into your confronting forties, you know, as I'm 51, I'm, you know, appreciating, you know, better balance, which is also enhancing the work I'm doing. So, um, what would you call your fifties? I'd call my fifties really my, my, my opportunity to be my best self. So I like that. You know, man. Yeah, I'd say my 40s were really confronting. I think that everybody, I think guys especially, but I think, I don't think anybody is immune to it. But I think, I think, you know, if you don't, something comes for all of us, you know, in our own work and our own journey. And that usually really kind of hits. I think, I think the cliche is like the midlife crisis, you know, when you see somebody in the sports car and getting the hair, it's, it's been often become a trope, but I think that it, manifests and I think everybody sort of finds their rock bottom in some form in their 40s that I think that um and as I was moving through that you know I really wanted to you know unlearn a lot of the um the work that and kind of the upbringing that I had you know I grew up in like you know 70s 80s Massachusetts you know where the you know, the f word and the h word and everything were out of my were like the every other thing that everybody said all the time you know so you know really trying to grow and come out of some of the traumatic environments that I sort of found myself in growing up um you know I had a lot of work personal work I needed to do which is in turn fed my creative work so I'm hoping the 50s you know as my girlfriend calls it the back nine are uh are where it's at well, dude, given stem cell research, you could live till you're 146. I'll take it. I'll take it. That'd be awesome. You, know? you make it I think, I think by that point, I think anything I'd want, anything that would like make me want to live that long would, would take away all the joys of, uh, of living in the meantime. So, you know, I, I live a, I live a full and, you know, balanced, but not restricted life. Well, what if, um, as we were talking about on the phone, Lucasfilm calls you up and they go, Hey, Greg, listen, we want you to direct the next Star Wars, but you're slated for production when you're going to be 137 years old. You're going to cling on to life for sure, right? No, you know what? I, you know, I definitely, what are the, I mean, I really enjoy, you know, I, I'm a product of mentorship and I've got a series of mentees that that is nice to foster and fan the flames. I still go back to USC and teach. I just taught a class a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, once House of the Dragon airs, I'll go back and teach a class on virtual production since um, you know we had an enormous amount of virtual production work in House of the Dragon. Um, they built one of the biggest volume sets uh, in the world uh, for us at Leavesden Studios in London. So that's a new way of working and a new and a paradigm shift for the industry in terms of the way we work. The, the it's been made sort of popular. It's been popularized by the Mandalorian because the Mandalorians like you know is mostly shot on interior sets with the and, and if, for those who don't know what the volume is it's a basically like an oval shape you know it's not 360 degrees because it's oval but it's like a fully enclosed ceiling w fully walled like made of like two to three thousand led screens that you know put backgrounds on there so you're shooting in virtual environments that move with the camera so it's a way to work that's 
the next evolution away from blue screen work. Now, quick rewind. So when you're you're discussing the 80s and 90s, now were your parents first generation immigrants from Greece? No, uh, they are second, I'm third. So my parents really Americanized us, yet we still went to Greek church, went to the one in Weston. We, you know, even though my parents didn't really believe, we were just like raised because that's what you did with Greeks. Like Greek religion and Greek culture are often very tied together. And that was something that I was brought up in. It's not something I'm part of anymore, but it was something that um, I was brought up in. So, you know, I still connect to my Greek heritage in a way that's separate from Greek Orthodoxy. But that was, you know, there was a lot of my parents who spoke Greek and were very like Greek was forced down their throat constantly and everything Greek and couldn't date anybody not Greek and blah, blah, blah. They really made an effort for us to assimilate more. So my mom rarely cooked Greek and that was reserved more for my grandparents to do. So on the weekends, we would spend the weekends with them. And that's where I would get a lot of the culture in terms of food and the language. And although I don't speak Greek, I was around it, but it was, um, I, I wish my parents had raised us with a language. I think it would have been a great way to have been wired in so that when I go to Greece, but interestingly, you know, Greece has a complicated relationship with Greek Americans and that their families left Greece and there's like kind of a long standing sort of resentment towards that. So interestingly, I feel more Greek in Italy um, because I'm of Mediterranean descent. Uh, than I do necessarily sometimes in Greece. Um, I think that's changed a bit as my profile increased. You know, that seems to transcend some of that. But for years, you know, I was, um, you know, trying to sort of reclaim that heritage and both my citizenship and my, you know, and with my kids and so forth. And I ran into a lot of obstacles of, um, of those kind of cultural issues. You know, whereas I, whereas Italy, when I worked there for for eight months, I felt like of the people and one of them and really embraced because I think there's a um, a real camaraderie amongst those cultures. Same thing actually when I found myself in like South of Spain working on um, House of the Dragon, like I just felt, you know, you just instantly kind of connect and you feel like of that world. And for some reason, I always feel sort of more at home in the Mediterranean um, than I do sometimes uh, in other parts of the world. That's interesting. I didn't think that my parents are, I don't know, my grandparents are second generation Irish American, and there was never any sort of resentment from Irish people for Irish people immigrating to the US. Is that constant throughout all Mediterranean cultures? You know, I don't know. I just, I only know from my experience and when I kept kind of running up against, because I was trying to get my, you know, I, my, my, um, my parents, you know, my, my family, when they came over here, gave up their Greek citizenship. So like going back to retrace the steps or, or to get mine, uh, you know, was a process. And in that journey, you know, I would be sent on these fool's errands and in the, you know, sometimes people would level with me and they're just like, look, like, you know, like, it's just, it's viewed as your, your family, like turned its back. Like you want to come back to Greece, like, fuck you. And so I was like, all right. I mean, I got everything told to me, you know, from the Greeks and I don't speak the language. And, but, you know, like my, my real hope was that I could bring work there. Like I'm, I would love, like I went to the Athens film festival with a film I had in the late nineties and I like took to it so hard and I wanted to make something like in Athens, I wanted to like shoot a film in Greece, you know, like, and now, now, and then your national production really wasn't a thing at the time. And like Greece is slowly catching up to, you know, uh, Prague and Budapest and, and the UK and Bulgaria and um, Malta and some of the other parts of Europe that, that you know, have more established, um, you know, film production. Why I ask is what generation your parents were is, with a lot of my friends who are immigrants, traditionally immigrant parents are incredibly strict and they want their kids to follow an archetypal lifestyle of, you know, get a job as a doctor or a surgeon. Yeah. Did you did you feel like that was forced down your no. throat a little bit? No, not well. I think there was an expectation that I would, you know, because I was my my parents went to, you know, college. My mom's a nurse and my dad was a was a teacher. I, you know, my dad partially went into teaching to avoid the draft. Uh, you know, because they weren't draft teachers put you further down 
the list. So that was a way to, you know, whereas my uncle volunteered to go to Vietnam, my dad had no interest. And so did everything he could to, um, you know, within the system that was available to do that. So uh, interestingly, my daughter's mom, uh, who's the uh, founder of Kosas, the cosmetics company that I'm involved in, um, you know, she is first generation uh, American. Every single relative, every single person in her family is from Iran. And, you know, my daughter being of now, you know, Medi- you know both Mediterranean and Middle Eastern descent, um, you know, but, but she, you know, every single person in her family is a dentist, a lawyer, a doctor, like that, mm-hmm. the, it's like, you, those are the three boxes you could check from. So the fact that she is also an artist, um, you know, really broke, you know, tradition uh, to the whole family and, you know, to great success, she's doing, you know, terrific. The company's doing great. And, you know, we're thrilled on that. So I did a lot of the video production relating to Kosas, um, you know, for the, all the way up until really I left for Thrones. Do you guys have a favorite person restaurant in LA? I just passed one yesterday. Uh, they, I have, I have a whole list. In fact, I actually just ordered in, uh, from, uh, Javon last night. Uh, I was Javon's. Like about, yeah, the J A B A N. Uh, I just got, I like, I was down by my son plays basketball and he's playing down at the Greek church. So I went down there, I went to the Greek market. I got some wine. I was like, you know, I had a place to myself, which is not always common. And I just ordered some kebabs and had the Gretzina. <laughs> And I had a, you know, and then just I watched uh, Station Eleven, which is what I'm watching right now. You had yourself a day. Yeah, I had I had like a few hours in the evening. I don't I don't get I don't really get full days anymore, especially being back. You know, it's really you know the the being gone so long on the show really makes it. Um, you know, it's like reentry is a bitch. You know, and getting the as they say. So it's like getting you know really the kids readjusting, working my way back into all their lives, their routines, their schedules, and and not returning and being a disruption. You know, I've got three kids, two marriages, um, you know, they're in separate places. I'm divorced from both moms. My girlfriend is um, in West Hollywood. So I've got four, we have kind of four homes in which geography needs to happen. So there's a lot of calculus uh, in a day. In fact, it's sometimes more has more moving parts than that any day of shooting for me. And you have a Chihuahua or, or a small breed. I got, yeah, I've got like- <laughs> Song creep by there. Somewhere. Yeah, 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 <laughs> he's floating around. He's, he's with me today. He's going back to his mom's today. He, go, he goes where my daughter goes, so. So um, I think I'd ask you this on the phone, but I, I just thought it was incredibly profound. So, I mean, essentially, and I'm sure you know this, like you just directed one of- the most anticipated television shows, primetime or premium television shows of this upcoming year and next year. And so like, you really, you've climbed the mountain, man. Like you did it. Is, is this how you always pictured it going for yourself? Um, you know, I, I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, like I, when I was in my, tw- when I first was like leaving for Hollywood, like I imagined, like a di- I was like, look, like I, I felt I was good at, whatever I was doing as much as I could in Massachusetts with no sense of perspective. You know, I, I, I had such limited access to books or material or classes that, you know, coming to California was so eye-opening and the movie palaces and like, you know, and, you know, it, 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 to put in perspective, like, you know, I was obsessed with Martin Scorsese and, and the movie Last Temptation of Christ was banned in Boston, right? Like the, the really? church intervened and it was not allowed to be shown in Massachusetts. And that was partially because like people burned down the Orson Welles theater for this movie called, um, it's called Hail Mary. It was like, it was basically like the Jesus Mary or the Joseph Mary story told from like a taxi cab driver and a gas station attendant or something. I might be getting the title or conflating it with another movie, but there was like such outrage from the religious communities that in Massachusetts, that that last rotation was just deemed too dangerous to show. So like, I came to California via San Francisco and like went to like a movie palace, never seen a movie so big. You know, I would go to like the Natick Sack Cinema or the Flick or to the General Cinema Framingham. And like, you know, you'd see it on a screen that was like good size, but nothing like where one movie is showing at one theater. And I sat there and I was sitting behind, you know, Jerry Garcia, like in a movie theater, what? seeing Last Temptation of Christ. And it was like blowing my mind to hear it, to feel it, and to see it. 
And I hadn't had an experience in the theater that hit me so much since Star Wars when I was a kid, when I was seven, which I saw like the circle cinema. Um, and I, um, I was so taken by that and, and the idea of, of, you know, what was, uh, I was, I'm sorry, I lost the thread. What was, tell, tell me, the, tell me where we were going with that. I got, I essentially from. said, you're the man now. Did you picture? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Way? So no, anyways, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I thought I was going to come here and like do my thing and become successful. Like I had no choice. It was just me. So like, I didn't give myself that option to fail. And I was just like a one man hustling band. So you know, I think the thing with this business that's that that someone said is that you know you can never stop winning. You know, and like when do you like when is enough enough? Like, I felt I I feel I've worked with so many great people. I've worked on so many great projects. You know, I'm interested in stuff as I got older to like work with grownups. You know, I think there's a lot of toxic people in our industry. I think a lot of them have been called out, but I still think it permeates the business. I think the business demands more for less and it's um it's you know the balance of the way america works versus the way you work in other countries is pretty difficult and i thought the recent iatsi negotiation might have alleviated some of that because the work hours are just insane and the work-life balance is insane so i really you know now at this point i look for things that that you know i mean i have to trade on going to work because of its comprehensive nature against time with my kids and my family so that's really the the, the bar than which evaluate so thrones is definitely an apex in anticipation and scale i've I already worked with the dune books and those were highly anticipated at the time but you know something like this and the scale in which it all sort of works is definitely like a high point i don't think i'm at the top of the mountain it sort of presumes that it's like down from here but i think you know i continue to want to find ways to keep myself creative that maybe move out of directing but still keep a certain mentorship but still sort of selectively you know pick the projects i'm working on i mean a lot of great things have come up since wrapping and right now i'm just focused on being a dad you know through the summer before i look at the next thing long answer how, how old were you when you had your first kid I was, my son was born in 2008, so I've been 38. Okay. Yeah. Because so it's interesting. I'm 20, go, what? go ahead. Sorry. What were you going to say? I said, I'm 26, and I'm starting to hear talks from my friends. Like, they're thinking about having kids. I'm like, you guys are crazy. That is nuts. It's so funny. You're the age of my daughter's oldest I mean, my, my 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 girlfriend's daughter's oldest so she had kids you know she got married at 22 met her husband at 21 got married at 22 had kids like right out of the gate and so you know her oldest is your age and you know and i have young kids so like you know that's something that you reckon with i mean i don't i don't know if you're ever ready i think that you know, I think there's, I mean, I'm glad, I mean, in a way, in some way, I don't want to, I don't want any more kids, but if I did have a kid now, I feel like I'm more equipped because I've done more work on myself and, you know, but I don't, I don't know if there's ever a good time or a right time, you know, to do it. Like it was, you know, I, I feel I got married because people were telling me that and people were telling me it was time and so forth. And I, I, I was so sort of head down with work that, I didn't have much of a life outside of it. So, you know, I don't, didn't feel that I was particularly good at that. And I think to be good dad, you should also like be good and ready for like the commitment that comes with it with a partner, whatever form that looks like. Yeah. I've, I've kind of gotten that perspective from a lot of people who've been successful in their respective field via the podcast. Like it just seems like there's just a trade-off on personal development for a lot of people when you are so driven to get out there and win like it seems like a lot of people who are entirely career focused really start developing their morals their standards in their 30s do you feel that way for yourself i think i i, I think that is it is a real chicken and an egg conversation because i think that the you know the drive you know what the engine that you there is sort of fueled by the hole that's inside you you know, and you're trying to fill that impossibly through work. And then work is an incredible distraction in your 20s and in your 30s and into your 40s and on and on. So it's, 
you know, I, I always think about, I think that scene in like Hurt Locker was so great when like, he's like in the cereal aisle after coming back from like diffusing, but he's just like, is completely lost. And then like finds himself like going right back into the, the heart of it because that's where like the world makes the most sense to him. So, you know, I was definitely head down. I mean, I was driven. And I think in your twenties that, you know, it was all acceptable because you're driving, you're trying to build your career, you're trying to do stuff. But like this business, somebody told me when I was first starting, eats families and no truer words have been spoken if you let it. And, you know, I let it, um, you know, a lot of work took me, used to be that all the work was in LA and then LA tax rebates developed, you know, New York kind of came up, Chicago, Atlanta, Vancouver, Toronto, you know, now it's international. It's like, the job, I rarely get offered a job. I mean, I made the point to stay in town for um, a couple of years and then that rolled right into the pandemic. So I, I was I was here for a good run to just try to be close to the kids. But the balance is always something you're trying to strike. There's no good medium. You know, this is what my kids were born into. It's not, um, uh, you know, their fault. Well, but James, it's okay. It's okay, good boy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, so he's, uh, he's a good watch. Waffle, come here. Come here, good boy. His it's name's okay. Waffle? Yeah, Waffle James. Waffle James. Waffle James is a rescue. Nice. Now, speak, speaking of tax rebates, you executive produced, um, Castle Rock, correct? Yeah, I did. Was that, was that your decision or any of your, um, input on trying to shoot that in Boston? Um, no, you know, that was, I came in on the first season, you know, I think this, you know, first of all, it was, you know, all, all, you know, so much of, of Stephen King's work takes place in Maine, you know, Massachusetts, Maine, you know, once you get out of the main cities, once you get into kind of the country aspect, so much of it, you know, is kind of fair game. So bringing it to a new England made total sense. And that, that predated me. Um, I came back to uh, EP on season two after doing um, one of the episodes, The Queen, that I'm probably like one of my three favorite things I've ever directed. And so, uh, but being in like Devon, Mass and being out that far, I've never really gone that far east out in Massachusetts. You know, my dad's from Stoughton. I have a lot of family on my dad's side and that surrounding Stoughton, Taunton, Canton uh, area. And, but I had never been out towards like, I had a like not an Airbnb, I guess an Airbnb, but I rented a place in Clinton, Mass, which I loved. And I was Clinton. like, like, yeah, it was like a, it was like a great town. It's like a movie theater and a comic book shop. And I had like I had all this great stuff. And like I had this like dream of like buying the movie theater there and like doing something similar to the now that you're in LA, you should check out the new Beverly uh cinema, which Tarantino owns. And he programs, you know, double features every night of the week. Um cool. so it's like a great theater and there's midnight showings of his stuff it was but it's been around since I was in college and he took over ownership when it was when it was kind of coming down but it's a um it's really an incredible uh experience so I had those you know dreams of returning back the weather was murderous you know like I forgot oh, like, I mean when I came out to California to visit USC it was December and I could not believe that people lived here I'm like I was in shorts I was like, I have to get to California. Like I had yeah. to get to California. So, and it's given me like a real love and appreciation for Massachusetts. Like working back in Massachusetts was fantastic. You know, my family is still there. Um, you know, I did get to see my folks a lot when I was working there. My brother's uh, since moved to San Francisco area. He works, he does content for Twitter. Um, so uh, it was, you know, it was great to be back. Like I would like go back there and shoot in a heartbeat. I was so cold like i realized i've become such a softy. uh softy in california for sure now you said you were shooting the queen in devon's were you at that huge sound stage out there or yeah were you actually yeah. so that's okay. that, that's, where, that's where castle rock was based out of which was great okay. i mean at the time it was like now productions are so ramped up i'm sure it's like not that case but it was like empty like we were the only people there at the time first season that started just you know as things have escalated you know, there's just so much content. I mean, TV has been a growth industry since the day I got involved in it. Like, I mean, not, not, I mean, literally there's been more shows made every single year for the last 30 years, every year, more scripted shows. Anyway. So it's, um, you can feel it. Cause like you can't get stage space. I mean, it was, 
buzzing at Leavesden. I mean, it was kind of cool too, because like Aquaman was shooting there, the Flash was shooting there, Barbie was shooting there, uh, Batman, the Batman had just finished shooting. So like Wonka was shooting. So you're like walking, you're just kind of like on these like walks around the lot, you know, uh, in between like, on your lunch break and long setups. And you're seeing all this production, you know, and seeing like Momoa go by on his motorcycle because Aquaman's like over at this stage or seeing like, you know, the Wonka sets go up was incredible. And uh, you know, all the while you're making like this other huge, crazy thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the bubble of that. And it was also weird because like, I mean, COVID made that production extremely challenging for us. So you were saying, yeah, I was going to get to yeah. this. Um, yeah. Can you explain kind of what you were telling me on the phone about how, for you, it was kind of an emotional roller coaster getting the thing off the ground. Well, it's, you know, you're coming, you know, it was, you're leaving, first of all, you know, it was, um, you know, the only, the only reason, I mean, it was exciting to get the opportunity. I mean, I, I go back a lot of years to Miguel Sapochnik, you know, who came out of features and moved into television while I was producing House. And uh, so it was a great, it was great to have a relationship with someone and then to finally get the opportunity to work together. And so in my mind, I remember when like Spielberg and Lucas teamed up on Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, they were friends and they went off to like create something together. And so, um, but COVID, you know, made it hard to build community and have people over for dinner. And there was all these laws in the UK when we first got there, it was like extremely locked down. You know, every time you know, we got, I landed, we had to like isolate for 10 days before we could go anywhere. This was, you know, we got vaccinated just before we left and both doses. And so there was still nothing in place for like that exemption. And then all of a sudden the UK went from being like totally shut down to like wide open. And yet, you know, when you go to work, you're under very strict COVID protocols outlined by all the unions. So those did not really evolve at the pace that the world was reopening. So you kind of go into this place where like there's much harsher and stricter rules. Um, to what effect? I don't you know, I don't know, you know, what would have been better or not better, but you know, it just made it challenging to schedule something that had so many people working on it. Um, and to, you know, every time you know, we had multiple, we have two simultaneous full units going at the beginning, which eventually expanded into four units. And, you know, when something happens, it ripples through the whole thing. So you are like every few days, sometimes having to change the schedule because when that many people are involved, somebody's going to get, somebody's going to touch somebody who's going to touch somebody oh, yeah. that makes you have to rejiggy it. And, and it's one of those kind of things that you can't just jump to the next thing you have to take into consideration the costumes may not be done or that set's not quite finished so it was very it was you know somehow we did it without really shutting down so we always managed to like do the dance and and we just had to be on our toes but there was a real feeling of like improving and jazz in a way to the way we had to work because it just had to stay flexible or you just get pulled over because there was no ability to anticipate what was coming and, and, every, and every country had a different set of COVID protocols so when we would you know, it was like, there's no outdoor masking in Spain. And then you cross the border to Portugal. And then it's like, okay, everybody has to put their masks on outside. You're like, what? And so, you know, and then you got to go back to London. And then at the time there was a 10 day quarantine. So you had to like anticipate that into your prep schedule. So suddenly you're working with everybody. Now you're just doing everything back on Zoom for a week and a half. So it was, you know, and yet somehow it all worked. And, you know, I've seen the first seven episodes and like I'm, I'm excited for the world to see it i directed episodes two three and the finale and, and you finished post on all your episodes no post is still going on right now i i've turned in my director's cuts of episodes two and three i'm working on my director's cut of episode 10 um, but post-production and visual effects will be going on um i imagine for quite a while Okay, so you deliver your picture lock, and then are are you overseeing most of the VFX with the guys, or is that are you handling? No, that's off? Miguel. Miguel, okay. yeah, I'm really, you know, I'm I'm a producer on the show, but um, you know, those that area, it's it is really Miguel's. He his co showrunner is, is Ryan Condal, who also has like a great podcast about uh, movie memorabilia uh, that's out there, and the two of them are co showrunners. So you know, Miguel 
you know, Ryan was really the keeper of the story and the lore and, and like everything Game of Thrones. And Miguel has like the physical production and the visual side of this thing, as well as the storytelling side is where they kind of like intermesh. And so there's a great dance between them and it was great watching their collaboration evolve over the course of the season. Um, uh, Miguel directed three of them as well. And so, uh, you know, getting us all to be able to like find a moment to kind of check in with each other was always the uh, uh, the goal, but you you know we could be you know in, in neighboring stages, but it's like it's such intense and intensive work. I will say though that I love the way the UK works, both on a craftsmanship level as well as the hours. You know, there were ten hour shooting days, which is civilized. You, know, you go from eight to six. You know, you're you, know, you just know your life, and you know you're going to be home to like eat dinner. And my girlfriend uh, moved out there with me, which was a big factor in being able to move away that long is to uh, you have my partner there. So, um, you know, just being able to like rely on that schedule was like a great gift. Um, and then just found that everybody could get proper rest, proper turnaround. And like, even if the crew was tired, they weren't like American hours tired, which is like insane that we work the way we do in this industry. Now, I'm sure you use an array of programs, but what VFX suite are most of your effects operating out of? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I feel like they're spread around. I, I know that there was a, I, I know, I, I can't remember the name of the house that was awarded uh, most of the effects, but I'm, I just think by sheer volume that they get, as, as do every production mm -hmm. of something of this scale or movie, they have to have multiple houses. So I don't know how they're distributed. I apologize. I, I phrased that wrong. I mean, like what software are you guys using? Uh, I don't have the answer to that in terms of what they're, um, I don't know what is proprietary to which house, you know, for example, you know, what we were using for the volume is the Unreal game engine. Yeah, right? so that's, we're using, that's what I'm using on my next project too. Yeah, which was incredible. But ILM, after the first season of Mandalorian, ILM made a proprietary kind of version um, and the name of it is Escape Escaping Me, um, but they made their own version of it and their own software for it. So, but you know, primarily on for the volume, yeah, I can speak to that. But in terms of like what they're doing, in terms of the visual effects, um, we did use the third floor for previs, pre previs, which was an incredible experience. We used the Cyclops in order to like render some of the environments with uh, cast or stand-in cast. Uh, as prep uh, to plan out sequences, which is also an incredible tool. And the volume itself is like magic. Like it's, it just feels like, you know, it's just, it's, it is. And those are some of my favorite days because, um, you know, there's like times you're using it in a much more technical way. So like everybody's doing their job and you kind of just need to like put your eyes on the performance and let everybody else do their thing for it. So those are my favorite because I love to be able to kind of walk around and watch everybody's watch just the, the machinery uh, of it, so. So I'll tell you, like, when I saw the eighth season of Game of Thrones, was it 2019, I think? Uh, and 2018, 2019, something like that. And I was just so unbelievably blown away by the visual effects that it is what compelled me to make my film. I was like, these guys just used all the creative space in their brain to just try to make something beautiful on screen. Like I will never forget that ice dragon shot of the ice dragon obliterating the wall. It was oh the God. most, yeah. it was, that was great. That's end of it was, seven. It was orgasmic, yeah. man. I was like, Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. And I, um, yeah. And so that's what, why I made my film incredibly VFX heavy. Cause I was like, if these guys are doing it, I can definitely do it now. When you, Did you do all your visual effects yourself? I worked with a suite in Puerto Rico, um, okay. a team called ABOT Studios, two person team. I'm going to send you a, like a 45 second clip. I yeah, kind of learned, I kind of learned after I was telling you, like, I am, a, I'm not much of a writer. I do love to produce, but I think you'll see that in our clip. Like, okay, this kid knows what he's doing producing, but he's got to hand off the writing responsibility to somebody else for sure. Okay. Um, but when you approached House of Dragon for this season, did you understand the, 
your responsibility or your obligation to make everything incredibly visually compelling? Like, was that a pressure on you? I, you know, I, it's, it's interesting you're saying that because I think, you know, like I did a mini series of the second and third Dune novels, um, Children of Dune. I mean, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. It was a mini series for sci-fi. It won the visual effects Emmy back in 2002. And if you were to look at it now, you'd be, it was actually the first thing in TV to shoot digital. Um, the only thing had shot digital at that point was uh, Lucas was doing the Phantom Menace at the time. And so, you know, we were able to use the previous miniseries um, as kind of like R and D to like evolve what our game was. And I think the same thing is here is that, you know, the priority list from Miguel, you know, is always like, you know, character story and then visuals will follow. And he had a very specific kind of visual design for the show and making that, you know, I, I've, I've always been able to make good shots and I think in scope and this, the show is, has enormous scope to it, even within everybody's like coverage, there's just so much happening in every single frame. So um, the character and story is always where I come from and the visuals chase that. Cause I feel like they need to be in support of what the scene is doing and, and, you know, I always find that Spielberg is a great visual storyteller. I always find that he uses the camera to tell the story at hand. And you know, when you mix that with something like Thrones, which is so performance heavy and character heavy, and it lives in the looks and the glances and the moments and the quiet. And you know, I've seen the original show all the way through three times. You know, I watched it when it aired, when Miguel was working on the final season and he was gone for a year and a half. I was like, you know, my great friend was like going and putting his guts into this thing. I rewatched the entire season, like as I, you know, as, a, as I was working out on my iPad uh, series. And then I came to the, um, uh, I came to the third um, time I watched it was when we were in isolation and my girlfriend hadn't seen it. So we watched, you know, we landed in the UK and just had a steady diet of the show. Yeah. yeah. Just to, you know, just to get the, you know, to get the scent and, to be able to, you know, pick up where the show left off and just, you know, the things it was doing, where the visual effects stood, you know, a few years back, what was going on. So it just, it was as much a research exercise as it was to really sink in. And what's so great in watching it was they're talking about our show all throughout the series. You know, they're talking about this time of the Targaryen dynasty all throughout the original Game of Thrones. So now, like the deep dive and the and the real fans that have really watched and digested that are going to go back to like these chapters in George's book um, and be able to really uh, and there was a great animated piece that they made as like a DVD extra because um, I was like also watching all the the extras behind the scenes because I was as interested in the show as how they were like physically making the show and you know some of the kind of ingenuity that they had especially in the earlier seasons like really lent themselves to how we were going to uh make the show you know i think miguel said something interesting he said you know the you know it's guerrilla filmmaking at a elevated level like you still need all the tools of your tv experience to be able to do things and maneuver you know a day of work and it's kind of the best of both. Like you get to be your best TV director and you're realizing things at a scale that every episode is like as big as any movie that's, that's out there. I was going to say, it kind of seemed like when you were describing getting to London, like you guys have the indie film hustle on like the most national commercial level possible. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's kind of great because it's like, it just, you know, you can't, you just, you, you, you I like that scrappiness and I love how creative, um, you know, I've had a great time shooting overseas with, you know, in both Budapest, Prague and the UK have been some of my best international experiences. Um, I've had not great international experiences, but those have remained there. And so that sort of, and it just, it just went, you know, especially when we were doing some of the, you know, some of the bigger sequences, um, you know, there's, there's some really, you know, incredible stuff that it was just like, I loved watching the crew play. You know, I loved in your and and being the kind of orchestrator of that, and knowing you can't get out there and play with everybody, but you've got to like kind of move all the pieces so that the play can happen. 
uh, were some of the great days. Like when we, we when you're in a flow on that show, there's there's almost nothing uh, nothing better. When you watch the original series through the three times you binged it, did you have a favorite character? And I'll tell you mine after you tell me yours. You're gonna be like, dude, you got problems. No, you know what? I I, I don't really have. You know, I I I think it's one of the it's one of the great things. You know, there's a show that I really love called The Bureau, and it's a French series. It's five seasons, and I, I highly recommend it. It's it's like it's really grounded, and and it deals with like it's kind of like a French version of Homeland, but it's an ensemble. And what I love about a great ensemble is that different characters sort of move to the foreground in different seasons. So, you know, I really anytime anybody was really invested in the performance you know when somebody was having a great season of material and performance I was like right there and like my guts were being ripped out I didn't I didn't I, I always I always just saw I admired the and having made some ensemble shows the difficulty of the that balance and the beauty of the way you know I, I, I you know it's funny I wrote to Dan and Dave after I wrapped that you know that the expression you know um, standing on the shoulders of giants like really never was more true than working on this like I was able to like be able to build and play in a world that they created and that mm -hmm. Miguel was taking and evolving and running with. And you get that great opportunity that you do like as they, you know, it's like Star Wars sort of established an aesthetic and then anything that comes before or after it is kind of working within that sort of that range. World, yeah. and, but you can push into areas and ways that is incredible. I think like, you know, when, when I was really excited when the teaser came out and people got to see the throne, you know, that was like, I was so glad that that was like, that's like a perfect example of like, oh, okay, so that's what the throne used to look like 200 years ago. Like all those swords, like melting down the stairs, like look at fucking incredible. I just think mm -hmm. like, I when I saw the concept art for that, I was like, that is really cool. So I geek out, I'm like a good balance between like both character and mythology. Like I just, I geek out on all those things. And so, the fact that like my last binge, I was like, oh my God, like I'm doing that scene. Like that thing they're talking about in that episode, like I'm doing like, mm -hmm. you know, so that's like great, you know? So those, th those kind of things like really hit for me is to, like be a fan of something and to be directing. You got to have at least one or two favorite characters though. Uh, okay. Well, you tell me mine. You tell me yours. Tell me what's Joffrey. What's I told you you'd think I'd be sick, but yeah, I mean, I just think that scene when he has the prostitutes in his lair and he's just, he's nailing them with the crossbow. It's just the sickest, most sadistic shit you could write. Well, you know, my, my, my favorite Joffrey scene was actually like his death scene because for all his like, and or when he like retreated from the battle, like when like, oh, my mom needs me, you know, like he, he, I just, I love I love, you know, when characters are messy and conflicted. Like, I think, you know, you I, you often run into it sometimes when you're going through the script process with, with some actors, you know, the, the contradictions really throw them and like, everybody's a contradiction. Like people are like good and bad and kind and mean and blah, 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 whatever it is, you know, that you're gonna find that. That's what makes a character great. So like him, like being so vulnerable, like in his death was so great. And, that, and, and, and you know, his work was so like, perfectly tuned so um uh, uh yeah but I, I could nerd out about this show but we'll go down a deep rabbit hole from there well you got to give me your characters man give me two um little finger nice I, was found, I just i just think like you know i always um i like i always like his right we just i just think like his performance was so beautifully executed um because it just it's like he's, he's manipulating everybody constantly but yet there's some like heart behind it but there's not but it's just so it's like again i like the the messiness you know and um i think Tyrion being on the outside of things and and you know killing his own dad you know is like powerful work and somebody you know who his performance, you know, and how and and, and character is constantly having to defend himself, and you know, and uses humor to deflect it, and and you know, and the grace in which he maneuvered the series, I thought was really beautiful, and so that was you know someone I really glommed on to, you know, because I think we can all connect in our own way what it is to be like 
outside or dismissed or not fit in. And that was really brought out into like a beautiful extreme um, and nuanced execution. I agree. I forget what little finger, I, I don't know the actor's name, but he was also in spy kids growing up, which actually happened to be one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> <Okay>. seen it. <laughs> I have seen it with my kids. Yeah. Well, speaking of watching what I watched when I was growing up, my mom and I, I must have been in fifth to eighth grade, loved house, man. Oh, loved good. house. Just an incredible, incredible show. And I just cannot thank you enough for what you delivered on that, man. It's just like, it, it's inspiring growing, like you never really know it's going to affect you later in life, but it, it was just, it was just an awesome show. You guys just built an incredible, incredible main character and everyone put that, is it Hugh Laurie is his name? Hugh Laurie, yeah. Yeah, everyone put him in a great position just to do his thing. And it was an awesome show, man. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, man. you know, I, you know, David, Katie, you know, really, you know, David, especially like really creative. It was a great creative space. You know, it was, it was, it was actually really where I learned my producing chops. I directed 30 of them. Uh, I produced a hundred plus other of them. Um, I was there at the very, very beginning of it. So like, you know, even a not great episode of house, it was still pretty good, you know, like you, because going to work with you, um, like if that show was still running, I'd still be there. Like that, that, he was someone that you loved coming to work every day and seeing. Like he, his process was interesting. His generosity was interesting. I loved, you know, who other talent that was attracted to work on the show because of him. I loved watching his kindness and uh, to everybody around him. You know, I've only talked to him in his. British accent a handful of times because he would stay in accent, you know, in order to like keep honing that. And he would, the way he prepped, the way he showed up to work, like made everybody want to do their best. So it was, an, I was, you know, when it was ending, I moved on to go do Banshee. And that's when I started moving into like directing show running, which I did until I got burned out. And, um, and it's been nice to have like a reprieve from that. You know, was great on Thrones as being somebody's like number three, number two. You know, I, I love dropping back and being in support of somebody else's vision for a while because um, I had a run of pretty intense production with like Banshee, rolled right into Quarry, rolled right into Unabomber. So like those three things, like and the, you know, the show running job is a wicked job. And it is, you know, I really like had a lot of compassion for what Miguel and Ryan were doing all the while, like writing, and directing and doing everything else, like trying to be creative in a very uncreative position, you know, which is show running. Yeah. Peeling it back. Like I, I've always felt like after I watch house, like I had a real medical degree. You guys always really simplified and clarified like these huge yeah. viruses. You know, just I, enough to be dangerous now. Like I hear stuff in hospitals or hear stuff at doctor's office. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I know what that means, but it, like, you know, uh, exactly like some i know some guy who got diagnosed with meningitis and nobody knew what it was and i just like recalled on an episode i was like i know exactly what he's going through right now man yeah 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 yeah. they do a good job of it. now um a couple more questions so i i'm always incredibly fascinated with how people in the entertainment industry start venturing into angel investing so how did you get tapped in with twitter um, well, Biz Stone, I grew up with in Massachusetts. I mean, he was also from Wellesley, he's a friend of my brother's. And so, um, you know, I was, I was supportive of his journey. You know, he, there was a lot of steps before he got to Twitter and Twitter came about. And, you know, I was supportive. I was getting involved in, you know, things that had their moments but didn't necessarily take off or were mismanaged. And, you know, I just followed him from company to company. And, if there was an opportunity to get involved, I got involved. So, you know, I wasn't, and I always wanted to be value added. That was something that I learned from Ron Conway, you know, who's, um, uh, is being a value added angel investor, you know, um, you know, how can you help the company? So like when I was giving talks, you know, one way I did that was like, you know, I was giving talks up at Twitter, uh, square, YouTube, Google, um, about the creative process of making a TV pilot and how that mirrored the startup process, you know, from kind of genesis to execution and 
there was a lot of lessons in both efficiency and kind of management that I took and those experiences that could apply to, you know, scaling up a company. So often when I, you know, that, that, you know, whether that was Kosas, which is my daughter's mom's company or Twitter or Square, you know, scaling up a company, management is such a different arm and skill, <clears throat> excuse me, than necessarily the creative work you're doing. Producing requires all different kinds of muscles than directing. So like, while you might be a great coder, it doesn't mean you're a great manager. And so because you're a great manager doesn't mean you're, you know, it's like Steve Jobs, like maybe didn't directly like code and do things. I mean, you had to bring people together mm -hmm. and he had a vision for what he wanted things to like, look and feel like. So like, you know, like as a director, I work very emotionally as a producer. It's like, you're the yeah, principal of the school and you know, everybody comes to you constantly complaining about who's doing what or who's not getting this. And, you know, you've got to be able to have a brain for that. And that requires, you know, a whole other set of muscles. So it was great to be able to be around in the early days of those things. And so one investment led to another and people would leave companies and start other companies. And, you know, for all the hits, there's plenty of misses and there's things that I wish I got involved with that I had the opportunity and didn't. And there's things that I, I did that I wish I hadn't. So it's, you know, the, the ones that stick out are the ones that have done, have done well. What did you pass on that you regret? Uh, beyond me. You Sorry, I didn't catch that. Say it again. I said beyond me. Oh, you could have invested in beyond me. Yeah, well, interesting, you know, at the time, at the time, you know, like, vegan based food was not was so, was so niche and like finding beyond meat was like just this extruded stuff that you would make other things out of like it wasn't like a product line and in talking to the guys like it was just one of those things like i invested in so many like dumb things that i was like like i, I don't know why i had blinked on it i just couldn't I, it was something i did not eat myself and i'm like who's gonna eat that i did not think of it as the future of food i didn't have that particular foresight of that in that moment and uh, so that one is definitely one that got away. That's probably like the main one. Um, you know, I like had beta tested Uber and like wish I had the, I didn't have the contact to get involved in that or with Instagram, but you know, like was sort of in the peripheral of those, but was, um, you know, but you know, my portfolio did fine. I've done fine and that was good, but that was one of those ones where I was like, ah, like it, it, and often what you really need to do is invest in the founders and like what they're like, who they are and kind of what they're after. And, you know, the vision for the company was very different at the time and it like, you know, it hit and totally exploded. So, you know, that at the time that that came around, it was like, you weren't seeing and hearing about plant-based and the, these kinds of things were like, not necessarily like in the, the lexicon at the time. When they pitched Beyond Meat to you, did you did you sample the meat? Uh, it was like, like I said, it was this kind of like extruded, like formless, colorless stuff that I could kind of find <laughs> in a little bit of, in like some of the Whole Foods in LA. So, um, and it's just like, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't, you know, and I, you know, but I was like, I should have like perked up when like Bill Gates is investing, this is investing, da, 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 and like, I just like, I just was like, you know, I just had made a, you know, I made a pass I wish I had taken, but, you know, there's always going to be those, those are, you know, like, I mean, I had, um, you know, I was like an early adopter of like eBay and Amazon and Netflix and all these things. So like, and I invested early in those and, you know, like left and sold, you know, when I wish like, you know, I had kept those investments, you know, across, you know, 10 years, but um, Square and Twitter and so on have all done fine, but it was, it was a great way to get involved with something that wasn't my field and that I had some contribution to make. So, you know, I, what I found is I'm really good with like user interface, the way people engage with something. I was really good and really broke a lot of ground with like how, like did the first live tweet with a TV show, did the first thing that like went on the internet that was like content based that, that was nominated for an Emmy, was able to like take like Twitter and take Hollywood and really sort of find the way that those two things work together. So that's where my mark laid. And so I like the way the contribution, if I had wanted to become a full-time investor and drop television and pursue that, I could have done that, but that just wasn't what my calling was. I was so much more interested in like, how can I use these tools to tell a story and expand the story I'm telling?
you were years ahead of your time, man. Well, we did cool stuff on Banshee. If you ever look at, and that's where I got to collaborate with my brother, you know, the way that we integrated multi-platform storytelling, the way we use social, the way we used like Twitter to increase our reach, you know, back in 2000, what was that? That was like 20... 11 time, you know, it was like, it was, you know, those things were like still not yet quite being done and driving the conversation to really make that kind of the cult following that it had, you know, and we created content. We had, we had stuff buried. We had like, you had to like to dive deep into the show to, to find it, to know where to go. There's like an origin episode for like deep diving fans. I wanted to make a show that I would want to see. And it was done with Jonathan Tropper who has the Adam project out right now, which is the number one show in the world, which is pretty yeah, exciting. It's, it's marketed like, all over Los Angeles. I'm seeing the billboards yeah, everywhere. No, it's, it's great. That's like, you know, my friends. So that's like great. And, and like, we love 80 genre so much and there's so much 80 genre in Banshee. And then to make something for like 14 year old me that would want to deep dive and go find stuff for a show I was obsessed with. It was great way. My brother had like a great mind for that. So we, he and I had like great collaboration to, an episode that like I directed, he did the title sequence for, and then we would collaborate on the social content. HBO, like at the time, had like no idea sort of what we were up to, but gave us like a little budget to work with. And it was great. It was great. It was for Cinemax. You know, was, the Cinemax was a great, you know, experiment that I wish still existed today. You're a man of many talents. Thank you. This has been great to be able to chat today. Yeah, man, I've had a blast. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, I'm looking forward to sending you a snippet of my movie and getting your critique on it. I definitely want to see what you're up to. I think you're going to, well, I'm actually really, I'm not going to tell you. So it's an, it's post-apocalyptic. As I said, it's incredibly VFX okay. heavy. Okay. But I think, I think you're going to think the way I originated an apocalypse in Boston is super slick. All right. I'm excited to see it. I want to see like, you know, that's why I remember when like Blown Away came out. I just like, was like, oh man, like, like blow shit up in Boston. That's going to be great. So I want to see. I'm dying to see. So you send it over to me. I will. And it it's absolutely riddled with Boston references. So we definitely okay. missed the mark there. I'll be in. Okay, cool. Um, now, quick question. What is the timeline on House of Dragon? Would you mind refreshing me? Uh, the air date has not been announced yet. And uh, so I don't know. I just know it's this year. Okay, cool. And... <sighs> For fans who were skeptical, I actually did enjoy the eighth season of Game of Thrones, but I'm sure yeah. you're I'm sure you're aware that like some people were a little dissatisfied with that. What would you say is different about this first season? First of all, in defense of the eighth season, you know, I think you know if you go back and watch the show like in one run, which you know I did really, which is the only time I've been able to do that was the last time I watched it because I had everything. Um, there's really great stuff in, in that. I mean, it, it moves at an accelerated pace. I wish it had gone on for a couple more seasons and spread out that story because it was so much and so intense. I needed more than just like a week to digest some of those moves. But, you know, I think anybody that misses the world and really what was the strong point, the thing that we really sat here and talked about today with the characters. I think, you know, it's an incredible story with incredible characters. And it's uh, what's nice is it's based on, you know, George's history book of the Targaryens. So you're taking history and able to realize it. So that's what's also exciting. You know, you're not necessarily coming in, you know, with with very strict source material. You've got this, you know, these chapters of a larger book about the Targaryens that you get to uh, play in. So um, I'm excited I, as a fan when like I was seeing new game of Thrones and watching like, and like realizing I was one of the only people in the world that was seeing this stuff. Like I was nerding out. So like as someone that also loved the show, like I got to make a show and do something that I was really proud of that I knew the fan boy in me would also get excited for when it comes on. Nice. Yeah. And again, I thought again, visually that season was the craziest thing of all time. Like, yeah, no, it's um, unbelievable. And Miguel and Nutter's work was like astonishing that season. I mean, they, you know, those are, they are two of my favorite directors in the medium. Color grade wise, are you bringing that, those like gray tones back to this show? It's kind of the dark, the moody look. 
You know, I'd, I'd rather let Miguel speak to, to that. Okay. You know, makes so, sense. I get it. Yeah. I don't want to, you don't want to give too much away. Um, all right. Hey man, I had a blast. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, it was great. It was great to see, you know, see you face to face finally. So, uh, anytime. And then, um, you know, if you settle in here, look me up. For sure. Yeah, I will. And I will, when we get off the zoom here, I'll get an address. I can ship you out a, a nice hoodie. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Listen, we, we, we end the show for post-production. You got to say something for me. So I'm going to say it once. Make sure you listen real close. You got to execute on this precisely. So you say, hi, your name. Right. And this is my golden hour. Directly after no break in between. Hi, your name. And that was my golden hour. So, okay. So you want me to say, hi, I'm Greg <laughs> Gutanis. And this is my golden hour. And hi, I'm Greg Gutanis. This was my golden hour. That was, that was. <laughs> that was my golden hour. So this okay. is, that was. Okay. I'm Greg Gutanis, so this is my golden hour. I'm Greg Gutanis, and that was my golden hour. We'll take it. You're supposed to say hi, but you're a man of business, okay. so why no. not? <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Let's do it. I take notes. Hi, I'm Greg Gutanis, and this is my golden hour. Hi, I'm Greg Gutanis, and that was my golden hour. Well executed, man. Thank you so much. Right. I appreciate it. You got it.